Um, thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Dr. Chelsea Rochive. I am a sleep expert and neuroscientist from Wesper. Uh, we are a sleep diagnostics company. Um, we detect a variety of sleep disorders, including sleep apnea. Um, I also do a lot of education for people to teach them about sleep and how it affects their brain and body. And today I'd like to talk to you all about sleep and fertility, um, in particular, how poor quality sleep is affecting your fertility journey. So let's get started. Okay, so today I'm going to cover a few different topics. The first topic I'm going to quickly go over is the science of sleep health. Then I'm going to talk about how sleep is actually affecting your fertility, how to get better quality sleep. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at the email I leave at the end of this presentation. Okay, let's jump right into the science of sleep health. So sleep's primary function is to keep the brain and body functional and healthy. And the brain itself regulates sleep, making it a biodirectional process. How does the body and brain regulate sleep through a combination of factors, including your personal genetics, uh, various chemicals in the brain and body, and a few different brain structures? Human sleep is divided into four different stages. There's three non-REM stages, stage one, which is light sleep, stage two, which is medium sleep, and stage three, which is deep sleep. We also have a REM stage, and that's where you generally will dream. Humans need at least seven to nine hours of good quality sleep in a 24-hour period and spend a sufficient amount of time in each sleep stage to remain healthy. We also know that there's two different systems in the brain that actually control sleep. One is called sleep homeostasis, and that keeps tabs on how much, you, how long you've been awake and how much sleep you need to pay off some of that sleep debt. And also circadian rhythm, which is how we actually time when we go to sleep and when we're awake. So sleep homo homeostasis is the sleep drive system. It keeps track of how long you've been awake and how much sleep you'll require to play off sleep debt. So the longer you're awake, the more pressure you'll feel to sleep. The deeper, more restorative stages of sleep, so stage non-REM three and REM are responsible for reducing a chemical called adenosine in the brain. And adenosine, when at high levels, really pressures you to go to sleep. So that's really your feel tired chemical. We also know that chronic sleep deprivation and poor quality sleep leads to persistently high levels of sleep debt, causing constant sleepiness and fatigue. Now let's jump over to circadian rhythm. That's the other side of the sleep coin. Circadian rhythm is your 24 hour biological clock in the brain. It controls the timing um, of many biological processes, including sleep, hormone release, eating, and more. Uh, it keeps us feeling awake and alert during the daytime and relaxed and sleepy at night. Humans have a different chronotypes. And what this means is your circadian rhythm falls at a different point on a 24 hour clock. Uh, so about 36% of us are morning larks. That means we'd like to get up early and go to bed early. 16% of us are night owls where we go to bed late and get up late. And the majority of us, 48% of us are in between bears, which means we fall somewhere between morning larks and night owls. Now, how does circadian rhythm work in the brain? Well, circadian rhythm is stimulated by incoming light information in your eyes. So when light enters our eyes, it stimulates the part of our brain that produces a hormone called melatonin. Um, when lots of incoming light is occurring, melatonin is suppressed from the, in the brain. And when melatonin is melatonin is suppressed, we feel awake, we feel alert. Um, and when it starts to get dark, melatonin levels rise in the brain, high concentrations of melatonin prepare the brain for sleep. And then about halfway through sleep, melatonin levels decrease and help the brain to prepare to wake up. Low levels of melatonin suppress sleep onset. And this is one of the major problems with poor sleep quality. These two sleep systems work very intimately together. Um, one cannot work without the other. And therefore, when we see that these two systems um, are not closely aligned, that's when we see a lot of chronic sleep issues happening. Um, so these are issues like 
insomnia, frequent nighttime awakenings, short sleep, and just poor quality sleep in general. So most Americans are not sleeping properly. Um, and how does this affect fertility in pregnancy? First, let's go over a few things that sleep actually does in the body. And so number one is sleep is very important for cell and tissue repair. So during the day, we accumulate microscopic damage. And this damage needs to be fixed, even if you're not aware of the damage actually occurring. A significant amount of this repair to our cells and tissues occurs in the deepest stage of sleep and three sleep. And when we're not getting enough sleep, uh, a lot of this damage doesn't, or a lot of this repair doesn't occur, and that can affect a wide variety of our organ systems and processes, including our reproductive system. So we know that women who are sleeping poorly, um, they're not getting the proper maintenance of their reproductive organs, so their ovaries, their fallopian tubes, and their uterus. And conversely, it's the same for men. So men who are getting inadequate sleep are, are not getting maintenance of their reproductive organs, so the penis, scrotum, and testicles. Another thing that sleep does that's absolutely essential is it maintains the health of the brain. So the brain uses a massive amount of energy and using this energy causes a lot of stress and damage to the communicating cells in the brain, neurons. And so like a computer, the brain and its neurons need to be rebooted and repaired. Most of this repair work happens during the deepest stages of sleep. When neurons in the brain aren't maintained, we see issues like poor cognition, a decline in all body systems and functions, dulling of the senses, poor mental health, and reduced physical performance. So basically, when you're not sleeping, because the brain controls everything in our body, um, when we're not sleeping properly, every system in the body becomes dysfunctional. And this includes the endocrine system, which is a system of the body responsible for hormone re regulations. Uh, the endocrine system is especially sensitive to sleep loss, and it's not unusual to see a wide variety of hormones get, become out of whack when we're not sleeping properly. And we know when hormones go haywire, we see sex reproduction and pregnancy hormones level, hormone levels change dramatically. Uh, sex drive is generally reduced. Um, sexual dysfunction, in particular in men, becomes more common. Sperm and egg health are impacted. And embryo implantation and maintaining a pregnancy can become more difficult because when you're sleep deprived, the body is under a lot of stress. So that leads us to talking about how these changes in hormones from sleep loss affects female reproduction. So I'm gonna go over some of the most important hormones that regulate fertility, um, implantation, pregnancy, and discuss how sleep affects each of these hormones. So the hormones I'm going to talk about, first follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, estrogen, prolactin, progesterone, thyroid stimulating hormone, and we're also gonna talk about melatonin again. Okay, first let's talk about follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, in, in medicine, we also just call that FSH. So FSH is incredibly important for reproduction and fertility because it stimulates the growth of ovarian follicle follicles in the ovary before the release of an egg from one follicle at ovulation. So when FSH levels are too low or too high, ovulation is negatively impact. So that means that ovulation become, becomes unregular or it can completely stop. We know that chronic, chronically short sleep duration, so less than seven hours, reduces follicle stimulating hormone by 20%. And this is correlated with issues with ovulation and falling pregnant. The next hormone is called luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone spurs ovulation and helps with the hormone production needed to support a pregnancy. So not only is it helpful uh, for when you do need to ovulate, it also once the uh, embryo implants, it also helps support the pregnancy in the long term. 
when luteinizing hormone levels are too low or too high, ovulation and pregnancy is neg negatively impacted. Uh, we know that luteinizing hormone increases with partial and total sleep deprivation, and this in itself can suppress ovulation. So really, just kind of reiterating here, um, really any effect on these hormones, whether it's increasing the hormones or decreasing the hormones can negatively impact pregnancy. So that's something important to keep in mind, that it's not always just that the hormone is suppressed. Okay. Let's go on to estrogen. Estrogen is really important for a wide variety of factors in the female body, um, from growth to going through puberty, um, so many factors. But estrogen also regulates um, FSH and LH, uh, which we just talked about. So abnormal levels of estrogen lead to abnormalities in ovulation or can completely stop ovulation. We know from clinical research that women with more uh, variable sleep schedules have abnormal levels of estrogen. So their estrogen is usually too low, but it can also be too high as well. Poor sleep quality reduces estrogen among late reproductive age women, especially. So if you are a woman who is over 30, that's uh, currently trying to conceive, um, your estrogen is going to be especially sensitive to sleep loss and poor sleep quality. Okay, let's go on to progesterone. So progesterone is necessary for implantation and maintaining a pregnancy. So uh, once an embryo implants in the uterus, your progesterone levels are going to get really high and maintaining these high levels of progesterone um, keeps the pregnancy healthy and helps to prevent things like miscarriages. Chronic sleep loss decreases progesterone levels, which may decrease the ability for the embryo first to implant. We also know there's a link between chronic sleep loss and increased risk for miscarriage. And we believe this is because uh, decreased sleep is associated with higher levels of stress and low levels of progesterone. And so not only is uh, low levels of progesterone problematic for maintaining a pregnancy, uh, but when you're not sleeping, you're also raising your stress levels, um, which raises your cortisol. And when our bodies go into a state of prolonged stress, so it's from things like getting sick or being chronically sleep deprived, um, our body stops putting so much value into certain processes, in particular pregnancy. And this is because pregnancy can be very hard on the body. Um, so our bodies will try to avoid other stressors um, in favor of doing basic functions such as eating, for instance. The next hormone is prolactin. Uh, so prolactin is really important because it stimulates milk production and it also helps with reproduction. We know that dysfunction in prolactin can suppress ovulation. So again, this is another hormone. When it fluctuates, it can make falling pregnant more difficult. We know that sleep disturbances change prolactin secretion and thereby may lead to suppressed ovulation. Disturbed or short sleep may also impact breastfeeding. So if you're not sleeping properly, um, you may find it more difficult to produce milk and therefore you may find it more difficult to breastfeed. Okay, let's talk about thyroid stimulating hormone. So thyroid stimulating hormone is a hormone that controls a bunch of other different hormones. Uh, function. So you can kind of consider this one of the master horm hormones. It oversees a bunch of the other hormones. We know that high thyroid stimulating hormone can cause an ovulation, which means it can stop you from ovulating. Um, it can result in reoccurrent miscarriages and menstrual irregularities. Okay. A thyroid stimulating hormone can also increase prolactin, which we just discussed. Um, so when prolactin is quite high, that prevents ovulation. Um, this is why women who are breastfeeding are unlikely to fall pregnant. It's because um, you need high levels of prolactin to breastfeed, and that prolactin also in turn reduces ovulation. 
we know that acute sleep deprivation causes a surge of thyroid stimulating hormone. And we also know that chronic sleep deprivation reduces thyroid stimulating hormone. So acutely, which means in the short term, maybe a few days to weeks will cause a massive increase in that thyroid stimulating hormone, which can cause problems with ovulation and can also trigger miscarriages. And in the long term, it can really reduce that thyroid stimulating hormone. So again, let's remember that if that hormone goes too far in either direction, up or down, that can be majorly problematic for your health and fertility. And finally, let's jump back over to melatonin. Uh, so I discussed melatonin briefly, but let's quickly talk about how it impacts fertility. So just to remind you, melatonin is the circadian rhythm regulating hormone. That means it helps the brain keep time. Um, it helps the brain go to sleep at night and stay awake at, at, during the day. Um, melatonin is also essential for egg health. And we know that erratic sleep schedules or melatonin suppressing activities such as too much light exposure before bed can lead to reduced egg quality. Uh, so it's extremely important to one, maintain a good circadian rhythm and two, do activities that are going to promote uh, healthy melatonin in your brain. Okay, so that was, we just covered female reproduction and a lot of uh, female hormones that are affected by sleep. Let's quickly talk about male fertility. So oddly enough, uh, fertility in men, when it comes to sleep is not nearly as well studied as females. So uh, scientists are only now starting to look at how sleep affects male fertility, but currently there's just not enough evidence. Um, we know some, some things for sure, however, and that relates to how sleep affects testosterone. So testosterone in men is essential for sperm development and sexual function. We know that low testosterone can result in a low sperm count and poor sperm quality or health. Low testosterone also reduces sexual function and can cause issues like a low sex drive or erectile dysfunction. So making it harder to perform during sex um, and ultimately that can affect a couple's ability to conceive. We also know that sleep loss dramatically reduces testosterone levels and chronic sleep loss can lead to reduced sperm health or male infertility. Okay, so that's just a very general overview of how sleep can affect your fertility. Now let's talk about what this means for your fertility journey. Okay, so the big picture is, and the science is very clear on this, that women that get less than seven hours of quality sleep are 15% less likely to get pregnant. We also know that women undergoing IVF who get seven to eight hours of sleep are 25% more likely to get pregnant than women who are both sleeping less than seven hours per night and more than eight hours per night. So um, we, we like to talk about how getting not enough sleep is bad for you, but it's also really important to point out that oversleeping, um, generally what we mean by oversleeping is sleeping more, more than nine hours per night can also be very detrimental for your health. Okay, so where do we go moving forward? What actions can we take to ensure that we're getting good quality sleep while we're going through the fertility and pregnancy process? Okay, so these are some basic sleep tips that you should be following. First and foremost, sleep time. Adults need seven to nine hours of good quality sleep per night. Pay attention to how much sleep you actually need to feel rest, well rested. We like to say eight hours, but that's just the average. So you should really keep a sleep journal or use an app to track how much sleep you need to feel great the next day. And that's usually a good indicator of how much sleep your brain and body actually needs. It's also important to allow yourself enough time in bed to actually achieve that sleep time. So even if you need seven hours of sleep, that doesn't mean that you should only be spending seven hours in bed. You may need seven and a half hours to actually achieve seven hours of sleep. 
Okay. Next is getting on a decent sleep schedule. And you have to be really strict about this. So you should be aiming to go to bed and waking up within a half an hour of the same time daily. That includes weekends, holidays, and vacations, no exception. And the reason for this is because it really helps to maintain your circadian rhythm and keep your sleep homeostatic processes and your circadian rhythm well aligned. Most of you have probably heard about sleep hygiene, but we'll just go over what that is again. Uh, sleep hygiene are just the habits and behaviors that you do throughout the day and night that are going to affect your sleep when you go to bed. Um, so it's really important to identify problem areas for you and work on addressing those issues and creating good healthy habits. So just to give you some examples of some sleep hygiene, um, poor sleep hygiene would include things like using electronics before bed, which can suppress your melatonin, having caffeine too late in the day, being really stressed before bed or um, doing high activity um, hobbies or things that might stimulate your brain too much before going to bed and keeping a poor bedroom environment. So a bed that isn't dark, isn't cool, isn't quiet or comfortable. Um, you can read more about sleep hygiene practices on the Sleep Foundation. Just go to the Sleep Foundation website and do a search for sleep hygiene. It's also really important that we address stress because stress is a sleep killer. Um, if you are a very high stress and you find it's impacting your sleep, you should be introducing some stress busting techniques into your nighttime routine. This might include things like meditation, deep breathing exercises, journaling, uh, visual, visualizations, and more. Again, you can find out more about how to de-stress before bed by going on the Sleep Foundation. There's also many resources on YouTube, um, apps, um, books, you name it. There's a ton of resources out there. And finally, if you have an issue uh, that isn't going away, such as you're having a lot of insomnia or you're still waking up feeling awful no matter how much you sleep and changing your lifestyle and improving your sleep hygiene isn't working, then it may be time to see your doctor. And this is because there's over 80 different sleep disorders, and some in particular are very, very common in our population. Uh, these sleep disorders include insomnia, sleep apnea. Um, I would like to say that sleep apnea is very, very common. 20% um, of the population has sleep apnea, including young, healthy women. And women who are pregnant are especially at risk for sleep apnea. Um, so if you are, you know, uh, sleeping lots of hours, but you're still feeling exhausted for no apparent reason, then you may want to speak to your doctor about getting screened. Other common disorders in women include restless leg syndrome and narcolepsy. Now, sleep issues can also be secondary to other medical issues. So, you know, again, if you have ongoing sleep issues, there's no apparent cause, um, it's important to speak to your doctor. Uh, health issues like mental health disorders, chronic pain, certain neurological disorders, chronic diseases like cancer, obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, infections, and hormonal issues can also cause sleep problems. So it's important to address those things, especially if you're trying to get pregnant. Okay. So I'm going to end this talk. Um, thank you so much for everyone who joined and watched today. Um, it's time to make sleep a priority. Sleep is just as important as exercising and living a, a healthy lifestyle. Um, many of us are just really bad at maintaining proper sleep, but it should be a part of your normal healthy routine. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My name is Dr. Chelsea Roshive. I'm at Wesper. My email is Chelsea, C-H-E-L-S-I-E, at Wesper, W-E-S-P-E-R dot co. Again, thank you so much and get some good sleep.